Welcome. In this chapter, we have been learning about the complexities of the U.S. economy and how domestic programs funded by the government, including Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and education affect the budget and the national debt. Though elected officials make public policy, many groups have a vested interest in getting policy to turn in one direction or the other. In order to enact any major policy initiative or innovation, three conditions must be met. A problem must be identif identified, a solution must be identified, and government must take action. A basic part of the American creed is the belief in principles such as freedom and equality. When people perceive inequality or unfairness, they expect the government to do something about it. Most government intervention is to promote equality of opportunities and to address gross inequalities that still exist within American society today. The appeal to the American sense of equality and morality that accompanied efforts to address many social ills in the 1960s was a major factor in the success of much of the Great Society Policy Initiative of the Johnson administration. Many of these programs have become regular fixtures in the American political landscape that we know today. Dominating the domestic policy agenda is the core governmental responsibility of national defense. Often, other aspects of domestic policy, such as energy and the economy, are viewed through the prism of national security interests, many of which have become increasingly sensitized in a changing and dangerous world. Sometimes different groups have different views as to how to solve a problem. Individuals known as policy entrepreneurs work in think tanks, universities, lobby groups, unions, and interest groups. These people propose solutions to policy problems and attempt to persuade politicians to adopt them. Once adopted, many policies remain active for years after the immediacy of the problem has been addressed. In many cases, the policy will go on to examine other aspects of the problem or consider new problems that have yet to be discovered. A visible and dramatic event that focuses people's attention on a specific problem and accompanying course of action is known as a focusing event. These events can take many forms, such as human tragedies, foreign crises, and environmental emergencies. Perhaps no greater focusing event occurred in the 20th century than the Great Depression and World War II. During the Great Depression, the, econ the economic plight of the country was so dire that the reaction of the federal government was unprecedented in its scope. Many of the policies driven by the response to the Great Depression have changed the role and responsibility of the federal government permanently. Can you name the president who acted on his vision of a great society? Lyndon Johnson managed to enact more large-scale social pro programs than any other president since Franklin Roosevelt. Johnson sought to create a great society where the demands of morality and the needs of the spirit can be realized in the life of the nation. The domestic economy is crucial to the well-being of a state and one of the federal government's greatest responsibilities. A sound economy raises the standard of living and promotes both social and technological advances. There are three main indicators of economic health. The first of these is the level of unemployment, meaning the percentage of people who are willing but unable to find a job. Typically, this ranges from 4 to 6 percent, but re recently it has been higher. The second indicator is inflation, which measures how the costs of basic goods and services change over time. The Consumer Price Index, or CPI, is a tool used by the government to track the costs of essentials such as food, clothing, and housing from year to year. The third indicator is the Gross Domestic Product, or GDP, which is a statistic that measures all goods and services produced by individuals and businesses within the United States. This provides a broad view of the growth of the economy. Analysts look at the rate of change between years. Currently, the rate has slowed to less than 2% annually. There are various theories on how to improve the economy. Laissez-faire economics is a theory that discourages the government from getting involved. 
This theory holds that the market is cyclical and will eventually come around without governmental action. Government action, when it does occur, may involve aspects of monetary policy. Monetary policy is designed to improve the economy by controlling the supply of available money. The supply of money is controlled by the nation's central bank system called Federal Reserve, commonly known as the Fed. The Fed has the power to set interest rates which affect the flow of money in the domestic economy. Increasing the interest rates limits economic growth and helps lower inflation. Decreasing the interest rates can stimulate economic activity and put more money into circulation. Another way the government can intervene in the economy is through its fiscal policy, how it chooses to tax and to spend. Taxes can be raised or lowered and spending increased or decreased depending on inflation and the need for economic stimulation. When the government spends more than it gets back in taxes, it incurs a deficit. When this happens, the federal government has to borrow from U.S. citizens and foreign governments. The total amount of money the federal government owes is called the public debt. In 2011, the public debt exceeded the GDP and is currently at its highest level ever, although by international standards, it may appear less dramatic. The government often uses both fiscal and monetary policy to respond to threats of recession, which is a period when the, na the nation's GDP declines in two successive quarters. When threatened by recession in 2011, the government initiated stimulus spending and the Fed maintained low interest rates. As a result, the GDP never dropped below zero. When government spending vastly exceeds revenues, national debt clocks have popped up around the, co the country with the intention of raising citizen awareness of the issue. In 1935, Social Security Act was a direct response to the severe economic consequences of the Great Depression. The Act created a program to provide retirees with a monthly income in an effort to reduce poverty among the elderly. The Social Security Administration provides monetary benefits <coughs> excuse me. The Social Security Administration provides monetary benefits to individuals when they reach a certain age or when they become disabled and can't work. These benefits vary according to the amount of money paid into the Social Security Fund during years of employment. The Social Security Fund is liquid. Contributions made today are promptly paid out to today's, to today's beneficiaries. Social Security benefits are entitlements. This means that all qualifying individuals have a legal right to obtain them, whether or not they paid a portion of their income into the fund. In this photograph, President Franklin Roosevelt signs the Social Security Act in August 1935. The collapse of the banking system meant that people, that money people had put away for retirement had vanished. With Social Security, the elderly had a source of income. Many workers, such as farmers and the self-employed, were originally excluded from receiving Social Security benefits. Over time, however, these restrictions were lifted. Today, more than 55 million Americans receive Social Security benefits. The benefits have also grown as more people entered the system for longer periods of time. In the 1970s, Congress approved cost of living increases to be applied to Social Security benefits, enhancing them further. The increases quickly surpassed the rate of inflation and as of 2010 were roughly 41% long larger than they were in 1975. In 2012, the cost of Social Security to the federal government was approximately $727 billion. The Social Security system is threatened by a number of factors, chief among them being the ratio between workers and beneficiaries. In 1935, roughly nine workers supported each elderly beneficiary today. Fewer than three workers support each beneficiary. These strains on the Social Security system are compounded by the pending retirement of the baby boom generation. 
cost of living increases, which mandate higher payments each year, and longer life expectancies. Politically, Social Security is a highly controversial issue. Presidential efforts at Social Security reform have been largely unsuccessful in Congress, and attempts to scale back benefits have proven ineffectual. Most often, Social Security has been protected by a series of tax increases, although these two have proven politically treacherous. Most recently, the George W. Bush administration supported a plan to divert some Social Security taxes into private investment funds. This plan, too, failed to meet congressional approval. The Social Security Reserve Fund may be empty by 2037 if nothing is done about it. Many fear that Social Security is headed for insolvency as the giant baby boom generation approaches retirement and retirees live longer. Welfare is a collective term referring to the public assistance programs designed to help assist the poor. These programs may provide benefits in the form of food vouchers or modest income subsidies, as well as direct, direct cash transfers to needy individuals and families. Welfare programs are means tested, meaning that eligibility is based on financial need. The federal government has developed a standardized measurement for identifying eligibility for welfare programs. This is known as the poverty level. The poverty level is determined by the cost of a family's essential needs, specifically three times the cost of a minimal nutritious diet for a family of any given size, of a specific given size. Since they have been officially observed in the 1960s, the poverty rates have risen and dropped, but reached a level of stability in the early 1970s near 12%. Since then, the numbers of the poor have increased with the growing U.S. population. Many groups are disproportionately represented among the poor, especially single parents, minorities, and the young. Although the percentage of Americans living in poverty declined during the 1960s, it has remained steady ever since. Meanwhile, the population has increased, raising the number of people living in poverty. The most prominent federal effort to aid the poor was the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, program, which ran from 1935 to 1996. This program grew dramatically from the 1950s throughout the 1970s. It reached its peak in the mid-1990s when it was replaced by the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. TANF, as that is referred to, was created to re in response to criticism from the AFDC um, had increased dependence on welfare assistance and discouraged parents from working. TANF restrictions on those who could receive benefits and the length of time for which they could receive them. It also established new work requirements. As a result, the number of people receiving this aid dropped by more than 60%. <clears throat> Unemployment benefits are another means of federal support for those who have hit hard times. Since 2008, in light of the dire economic situation and amid a lot of partisan wrangling, Congress has granted extensions to these benefits several times. Other federal initiatives include Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, which tries to aid the most destitute in society, to be eligible, one has to own less than $2,000 in goods. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, is one of the largest and most visible types of welfare, providing coupons that can be redeemed to purchase food items. The cost of this program in 2011 surpassed $70 billion. Created in 1974 to aid the working poor, the Earned Income Tax Credit decreases income tax amounts. These benef this benefit is notable because it receives fairly broad political support from both major parties. In 1970, when this photograph was taken, the federal government launched, launched the Federal Food Stamp Program. The U.S. welfare system was created much later than the welfare programs of other, other Western countries. Social welfare programs were originally developed in Germany during the late Industrial Revolution as an attempt to politically satisfy the newly empowered working class. These ideas spread throughout the continent rapidly and most European countries had some form 
of welfare by the beginning of World War II. The scale of welfare programs in Europe is also much larger than that of the U.S. In terms of public welfare expenditures, the most recent analysis ranks the U.S. as last out of 10 industrialized democracies. The differences in the welfare systems in America and Europe may result from cultural differences. The emphasis on American individualism may be one reason some don't support welfare programs. The American system of checks and balances may discourage major social legislation. However, these explanations have limitations and don't account for the popularity of Social Security and the success of many great society programs in the U.S. Now that you know more about the welfare system, can you identify the answer to this question? TANF also has firm limits on how long recipients receive welfare benefits. Public education was considered a state or local issue through the 19th century. Federal involvement was, the, was limited to granting public ed land for schools, which were administered by the state or local community. This changed dramatically during the Cold War, specifically with the launch of the Sputnik satellite by the Soviet Union in 1957. The government and the people feared that the U.S. was falling behind in science and science education. Channeling federal resources into public education suddenly seemed like a matter of national security. In 1958, the National Defense Education Act had as its primary focus emphasis on science, math, and foreign language training. This was the first major education policy initiative. From its beginning, organized public education suffered many inequalities in terms of quality, funding, and accessibility. The federal government started to address these inequalities in earnest after World War II and continued throughout the Civil Rights era of 1960s. In 1965, Congress passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was designed to reduce educational inequalities by directly aiding school districts with large numbers of poor citizens. Congress sought to extend educational access to the physically handicapped in the 1970s with the passage of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which had the acronym IDEA. This program is often referred to as an unfunded mandate because it requires state and local action to comply with the act without the necessary funds to carry the actions out. Despite these and other measures, many inequalities still remain especially in terms of high dropout rates among ethnic minorities. This photograph shows students bravely walking toward the formerly all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. As the U.S. educational rankings among industrialized nations plummeted throughout the latter half of the 20th century, the federal government has become more involved with establishing educational standards that schools and students are required to meet. This table shows that American students don't score very well on standardized tests. Why might this be and how do you think the problem might be fixed? The year 2001 saw the passage of the No Child Left Behind Act. This act not only emphasizes the role of standardized testing throughout the public education system, but also holds districts and schools to a higher level of accountability than ever before. However, it's yet to be shown that the NLCB has made any substantial improvements in student achievements. In 2011, the NCLB underwent some changes designed to allow the states more control over measuring standards and more recently, the Department of Education has been granted extended authority in determining state eligibility for federal education funding. In this 2009 photograph, student journalist Gopa Praturi, age 10, interviews U.S. Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan on the first day of classes at Wakefield High School in Arlington, Virginia. Invoking the free market model, many education reformers hold that schools fail to thrive because of lack of competition. To this end, many communities have developed charter schools. 
Charter, charter schools are public schools administered by chartering boards that are exempt from many rules and regulations applicable to traditional public schools. Charter schools have increased in popularity each year since their inception in 1991. Since the early 1990s, the number of charter schools has risen as seen in this chart. School vouchers are tuition subsidies that reduce the cost of sending children to private schools. This controversial innovation began in the Midwest during the 1990s and publicly funded voucher programs have since spread to several other parts of the country. Chartered schools and vouchers de-emphasize the role of government and education.